I'm worried about where an AI does stuff for you and you're not involved, even if you want to be involved. Sure, if you don't want to be involved, fine, great. But what if I want to be involved? What if I want to tweak an output of an AI? What if I want to influence it more? Hello, welcome to the DevTools FM podcast. This is a podcast about developer tools and the people who make them. I'm Andrew and this is my co-host Justin. Hey everyone, we're really excited to have Lou Wilson on the podcast with us today. So Lou, also known as Toad Pond, uh, has been doing a lot of really interesting demos at TL Draw. Uh, so excited to dig into that. Uh, Lou, thank you so much for being here. Um, I've been going through your blog over the like last several days and they're just such rich writing and also i just love the like voice that you have the creative <laughs> voice and i stumbled upon this one article that you wrote about like how the toad pond name came to be so i would love to talk more about that but maybe before we talk about that can you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself yeah sure hi i'm i'm lou or luke um either's fine and yeah i work here at teal draw um four days a week um Mostly my job is, at the moment, it's making these wacky experiments, trying to push the boundaries of what's possible with this teal draw library, like what's possible on a canvas. Um, but yeah, like you say, I, I also write way too much on, on my blog, <laughs> um, which, which is a more recent thing. And like, yeah, I also go by Toad Pond, I have a YouTube channel where I post really stupid videos. <laughs> um, and I'm also researcher in residence currently at uh, Ink and Switch, which is a independent research lab. So I'm doing a bit too much at the moment. Uh, <laughs> really happy to be here to talk to you about like whatever whatever part you you'd like to to hear about. Really, yeah. I mean that's all exciting. Uh, again, love the work that you're doing at Teal Draw. We're both big thick big fans of Ink and Switch. They've done a lot of really cool stuff. So excited to talk about that too. So one of the articles that you wrote that I really like is about the origin of the Toad Pod name. And you start by describing kind of uh, some mods that you were writing for Team Fortress 2 way back in the day. So can you kind of tell us that story about like how it evolved? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I guess my entrance into coding was through the game Team Fortress 2. Um, and if you don't know, there's there's like a modding community there um, that you know, makes all sorts of customizations for the game in this language called Source Porn, and it's it's not as rude as it sounds, right? It's it's like C, and that was my first language. Um, basically, me and a friend wanted to customize the game. We wanted to add new items and 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 tweak numbers and things like that. Um, it was funny because it, like I was I think I was like 16 at the time and this was my first experience of putting something stupid up on the internet and it going relatively viral and you know this is this is in team fortress 2 modding community viral so it's not that <laughs> impressive but for me it was it was crazy and um uh I put out like a a made up an imaginary update for the game called the biggest update ever or something or something stupid and um and people started to ask me are you actually going to make this for real right are you actually going to take these these crazy like jokey ideas um and make them real and me and my friend decided that we wanted to try to do that so that's why i learned to code um we we created a little community around it called tf2 tightrope it had we had quite a lot of regular players and community members, and so that again was my first experience in trying to lead a community and like build a community at the age of like 16, 17. I did a terrible job and learnt a lot. <laughs> um, I eventually just didn't have enough time, went to uni, handed it over to someone else, but I still kept on like working away trying to build like a, a fully customizable Team Fortress 2. And I ended up doing the really stupid thing of trying to build a programming language <laughs> to let anyone do it. Like, um, and it was supposed to be really easy to do, even if you don't know how to program, because I wanted to help out people like me who just wanted to try stuff. Um, I eventually realized that that was a waste of time. 
<laughs> because like wh why am i building a programming language for this one video game but i actually started to really enjoy it um and i enjoyed like the the stupidness of this language like it, it was very jokey it had lots of jokey features in it like that weren't actually good and so then this is how and you may have heard of it dreambird got created right so i changed this jokey language which was only for team fortress 2 into a jokey kind of like parody of JavaScript. And that's now like my most uh, successful or like most viral project maybe. Um, like skip a few years and I needed like a better name that wasn't related to Team Fortress 2 at all. Um, so my partner, uh, Flora, hello Flora, uh, she suggested I call it Toad because it's like code with a T. And she likes frogs and toads, um, and she she's a she's an illustrator and animator, and she drew a little red frog, and and it's just stuck, it's just stuck this whole time. Um, that's there's there's even more detail in the in the blog post, but that's like probably as, as deep as I as I should go right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> glad glad to share that with people now nowadays. It's a fun story, but your your brand is like. Your brand, You're, the the toad is very recognizable. Like I, I think I knew you as Toad Pond before I even knew your name was Lou. <laughs> it's like that's just like how I had seen uh, the references and everything. So it's it's a really cool story. Yeah, I mean it's it's been nice. Like it's gone through a few revisions over the years, right? Like it it was very wobbly. Like it was very sketchy for a few years, and then Flora saw it one day and she's, like, I'm so I have to clean that up. I, I did, like when I first drew that, I didn't realize you were going to use it for so much. I have to clean it up. So there's a point in in like the YouTube videos where it gets a bit smoother and stuff. Mm. <laughs> so it's gone through a few revisions, but yeah, the same red toad. It's awesome. D does your partner do all your design for those sort of things? Because I notice you have like a very common theme of illustrations throughout your projects. Right. Um. She yeah. She mostly does, and like um, uh, I feel very fortunate about that. And and like there's a lot of hand drawn like frame by frame animation in my YouTube videos, and that's all by her. Um, wow. I I can't afford her, but <laughs> if I ask very nicely, then she does. Or like I realized another way that that that, that motivates her to help is that often I try to draw and animate these things myself, and it looks really bad. And she sees it over my shoulder and just <laughs> pushes me out the way, <laughs> and does a much better job at it. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's amazing. Like, I feel very lucky to um, be building these, like, creative coding projects and have this kind of, like, and, and then combine it with some animation. Like, I, I don't see anyone else doing that sort of thing, so it feels nice to be able to, I don't know, like, yeah, like you say, like, have a bit of a brand around it. Hey there. We'd like to thank our sponsor for the week, Clark. Clerk offers complete user management out of the box, so you don't have to worry about getting auth set up in your app, and you can just focus on actually building your app. Clerk supports a whole bunch of different ways to authenticate into your app. You can do traditional email and password. You can do social logins. They have SSO. They have magic links. Literally any way you would want to have your users authenticate, you can do it through Clerk. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. They have a whole bunch of other things that you probably don't want to do, like detecting if bots are trying to log into your app. They support that all for you. One of the best things about Clerk is their components. When you're integrating with Clerk, all you have to do is use one simple component usually. Today I saw a tweet where, where you get a whole nice polished experience for a login. That's literally just one React component, no props. Easiest thing to do in the world, and you'll be able to start building what you want instead of off today. And if components aren't your jam, they still have your back. They have a wonderful SDK on many different languages that allows you to integrate with their authentication like a breeze. But the best thing about Clerk is their free tier. You get up to 10,000 monthly active users before you start paying a dime. If you want to learn more about Clerk, head over to clerk.com to check them out, or you can go back to episode 75 where we interview one of the co-founders, Braden. It's a really good listen, and you'll get some perspective on where they came and where they plan to go. If you're tired of hearing these ads, you can become a member on one of the various channels we offer it. With that, you'll get the episodes a little bit earlier and ad-free and also be supporting the podcast. If you want to find another way to support the podcast, head over to shop.devtools.fm and buy a hat or something. Anything you can do helps keep the podcast going. 
And with that, let's get back to the episode. So in your work, even outside of TL Draw, you are like incredibly creative. I think those ideals you were talking about of like creating a, a programming language for Team Fortress 2 have really carried into your other projects <laughs> uh, and just like doing things because they feel weird and fun. So like, how do you like find that creativity and like pursue those projects? And like, what's one of your favorite projects that's that's weird and interesting? Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because... I started doing all, all of the creative coding stuff when I was a teacher. I used to be a teacher. I worked in schools. I worked with children with additional needs. And like for me, these projects were like an outlet. You know, I'm on my feet all day. I'm using my social skills all day, you know. <laughs> so there's like creative coding felt like the complete opposite of that. You know, I could come home and just sit in front of the computer for a little bit and just make something make something colorful and visual and kind of like just get it out, you know? And so that's always been the motivator for me. It's like I have a feeling and it, it can sound as crazy as it's, it might sound crazy, but like, you know, I have a feeling inside me and I need to get it out. I need to express it in some way, right? Like maybe I need to I, like pick up a musical instrument and play some music or I put some shapes on the screen that kind of represents how I'm feeling, right? So like... This, uh, I think one of my favorites is Screen Pond, which, and, and I did a video about it called Screens in Screens in Screens. And it's kind of a way of drawing fractals, drawing infinite drawings. So you, you can draw a screen inside itself so that then you can see another itself inside itself and it goes forever. And like, I'm, I'm coding this, trying to get out some feelings of being overwhelmed, right? trying to get out some feelings of being stressed and like try and put that on the screen basically. And I don't know, that's how it always is for me. I, um, I think some, some people like find it fr frustrating that, that, that they find it harder to, to like express themselves in that way. Um, and, and I didn't always find it easy, but when I, when I was working with these children that I worked with, you know, I'm constantly encouraging them to find ways to express themselves positively, right? <laughs> like, hey, maybe don't throw a pencil at, at Mr. Wilson, right? <laughs> maybe let's go and throw a tennis ball outside, all right? Or like, maybe don't rip up uh, a piece of paper, <laughs> your, your work, you know, maybe let's make some confetti instead, right? So I think like after saying that for like, you know, six years straight, you, you, you start to realize it yourself, you know, like, even though I'm, you know, I'm an adult and I'm mostly doing okay and I mostly don't need to do that, it's still something that we can do. And and I don't know, does that resonate with you at all? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. One thing's led to another, and then one idea leads to more ideas, which leads to more ideas. Um, and I and I don't have enough time to try them all out. Yeah, I recently said to my partner, if I could invent one thing, it would be the that time room from Dragon Ball Z where you can just go in and no time passes and you can like get really good at your thing. I, I want that so I can just like finish my side projects and not have to like do it in during my normal life. <laughs> I need that so much. I need that. Like, I mean, it. I feel really lucky at, in my job at Teal Draw at the moment is that I can spend a lot of time on that sort of thing. Um, but even so, the, the, my list just keeps getting longer, you know? Yeah, I definitely feel it. it. It's great that you've found an expression, though, that's both, like, an outlet, but also, I think it's also just fun to encourage and inspire other people. And that's, like, a, a lot of what I really like about the stuff that you put out. Um, I want to talk about one more of your posts uh, before we move on and talk about maybe some of your work at Teal Draw. Um, so a lot of you're you're involved in the Future of Coding podcast uh, and and in that scene in London, a lot of people in the Future of Coding space kind of like to put Brett Victor on a pedestal. Uh, for those who don't know who Brett Victor is, you should just look him up. It, it's it'll be an interesting read. Uh, and you have an article that is really interesting where you uh, somebody had emailed you and said, "Oh, I think like Brett Victor's a modernist, and you're a postmodernist," and sort of like you kind of write an article about like what that means. One of the lines that you have in there that I really love is you say, uh, sorry, reader, better tools won't save you from shitty drawings. 
<laughs> and this reminds me of the like tools for thought movement where everybody's like, no, if I just find the perfect tool, I'll think so much better. And I'm like, actually, no, you're not like, that's not going to happen. Anyway, I would just love to hear more about your like philosophy about tools and technology and sort of how you think about these things. Sure. Yeah. And like for context, yeah, like there is kind of a running joke within like the future of coding world and the future of coding podcast that. I don't know. I, I, um, I'm constantly trying in the in the future of coding world. I feel like so much is like under Brett Victor's shadow, right? Like the number of talks I give, or the number of things I make, and then like the first thing that people say to me is, "That's just like Brett Victor's stuff," you know, like, and or like, "Hey, you really got to check out this guy, Brett Victor," and like for sure he's been this. Uh, his work is such a huge inspiration, you know. Like it's, 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 it, yeah. If you don't know who he is, you need to like go and watch all of his stuff right now. <laughs> quit this. No, don't quit this video. But like, <laughs> yeah, it's so, it is really inspirational. And, but I think, you know, being in that world, trying to establish yourself and your work, like involves saying not just how you're the same, but saying how you're different. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very easy to say how you're the same. You know, like you can catch me basically repeating some of his same messages but like it's it's funny to see to me it's funny to see the resistance you get where you try to say how you're different it doesn't mean that like you hate them or you think they're a bad person it's just like you know I think everyone has different views on these things um and yeah like my my line about better tools won't save your shitty drawings, right? It, it's tongue in cheek, really, you know, it's a lot, a lot of the stuff I do ends up being, yeah, very tongue in cheek and kind of like intentionally provocative. Um, but like, what I really mean there is that um, I disagree on what like better tools means, right? So in, in the tools for thought space and the future of coding space, I think people often think of better tools as things that are more powerful, things that can do more, right? Like, oh, but like in this tool, you can create a diagram that is 10 times more complicated, right? And I don't think having a more powerful tool or, or a, even an easy tool means that you're, you're going to make better things with it, if that makes sense. So like um, um, Teal Draw, I think is is a really good example for this because like it's it's intentionally a bit wobbly you know like when you draw something like when you when you draw some ink it's splodgy it's imperfect and when you draw a rectangle even it has some randomness it's actually quite hard to make things line up if you use the default settings sure if you really want to you can go and turn all of that off right but like I think you should try it right try it and it actually makes things harder it, it makes it harder to just like draw because you're worrying about making it look good, right? And so like having a, hey, it, it makes it easier to line things up and look neat, but there's something else that's that's blocking you there, you know? So like um, some, of, some of the work I've done, I made this like music making tool called Aroost um, and I made a video about it. I'm probably gonna do more with it in, the, in this year. And, and its its goal is to sort of uh, make this point that it's actually quite hard to use a roost, right? It's actually kind of like a bad tool <laughs> for thought. But what it does do is it's it's very playful and it's very silly. So it kind of just like helps you relax a bit. And when you're making music with it, when you're making sounds with it, you know, you, you don't need to worry so much about what comes out because you can kind of blame the tool. Like, don't worry, the tool is bad, right? <laughs> like, so a worse tool is helping you because, because there's less, like, consequence when you make something with it. And I'm still figuring out how to ex explain this properly. I'm still trying to write up an essay about it. Um, so, and I'm kind of doing that in public, right, with these blog posts and seeing the response. Uh, this one had a slightly better response that you mentioned. Some of the other ones have had terrible <laughs> responses. So that's part of, like, the... That's why I write so much, is, is to learn how to like write things better. Does that help at all? Does that, does that explain anything? <laughs> great, great. Yeah, absolutely. 
the, something that I, I, I tell people, I get a lot of people reaching out and like, oh, you talked to so-and-so, that's so cool. Like, how was that experience? And um, I guess there's like kind of two things that I end up thinking about a lot is like one, it's like we really shouldn't hero worship. Like people are people and they're just, they're just people, you know? And it's like, yeah, some people have done really interesting and cool things, but they're still just people. And then the other thing is like tools, like only marginally make you better. It's like putting in the reps and building the skills that really, you know, just putting in the time as we've been talking about is the thing that's really important. And the tools can, can make it easier or faster or something, but like the tools aren't the point. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. There's something has to come from you, you know, something has like something has to come from you. You can't just rely on your tools. Um, and that's it. Like I, I, sometimes I feel like I need to tell some of like my subscribers or patrons or whatever to not worship me as well. Like you can disagree with me, you know, like, in fact, like I want people to disagree with me. Um, and, you know, just like I'm disagreeing with someone else in this community, um, you can, <laughs> you, you are allowed to disagree with me. And, um, so like, I want to be like a living example of that as well. You know, you can disagree. It's fine. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, I, th I think all the new AI stuff kind of, it, it plays very interestingly with all the stuff you just said, because it's like, it's a, it's a tool. It may not be a better tool, uh, but it helps you produce like maybe better things, but it has this like such low amount of control. It feels like no effort and it's just kind of like a fun creative space. So uh, you've been playing around with those ideas a lot at TL Draw. Could you explain to us and our audience what you do at TL Draw? Yeah, sure. So like um, at TL Draw, I'm a software engineer, but increasingly so my role is less like traditional engineering and more experience making experiments and sharing that um, in tweets, in talks, and so on. I think the first one that really exploded was this experiment called Make Real, um, where you can like draw a picture of a website and then you hit a button and it turns it into like a functioning website. Um, so this is something I, I, um, I built on top of uh, Sawyer Hood's original um, demo. Um, uh, the change I made was putting the website back onto the canvas and then being able to draw on top of it. And that was really important for me um, because you can sort of start this feedback loop. You know, like you say, you know, um, when you send something to an AI, you kind of like, you lose control, right? You know, whatever you get back, you're stuck with. And so for me, that's like a really important part of all of the AI things I make is that there's this back and forth, this feedback loop. Um, so yeah, so another one I made was this thing called draw fast, where you're like, it's image generation, but it's not like you just give a prompt and then it, you get it back and that's the end. It's something that's happening in real time. You draw on the screen or you draw over an image and an image grows out of that basically in real time. And it's the same idea, this feedback loop. Uh, more recently, I've been experimenting with how do we get autocomplete to work on a canvas? Because it's like one of my favorite uses of AI is autocompleting text. And I find it frustrating that I don't have that on a canvas. So um, I've been figuring out how to get that to work. I like it because that feels like, you know, autocomplete feels like a back and forth already. You know, like you don't have to accept the suggestions. You, you can try and influence the suggestions in some way. And you can see how like different possibilities unfold. Um, and much more recently, like literally like last week, two weeks ago, last week, I can't remember. Um, I've been doing this draw maths thing, teal draw maths. Not sure if it has a name yet, um, which was basically, and I said this before we got onto the call, um, Apple released a calculator for an iPad, for their iPad. And they, they added this like canvas called math notes where you can write and draw sums. And then uh, the AI, Apple intelligence, uh, will like answer it in real time. And that evening, I got like a hundred people atting me and DMing me and atting Teal Draw saying like, you guys, you're going to make this too, right? You can't just, you can't just let Apple do this. You so 
I basically abandoned the thing I was going to work on that week and just did that all week and like live tweeted the whole thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm making these experiments. I'm figuring out how to how to how we can use AI on the canvas and and how to make the user like an active role in it and sharing it all in real time. That's that's what I do currently at Teal Draw. Yeah, those those demos are so cool. It's like uh, there's one of them I'd seen recently where you like drew a bee and it has like one stripe and another bee with like two stripes and it like sums it up to three. I was like, that's that's pretty hilarious. <laughs> bee maths, yeah. And that do you know what that one was because thanks to Flora actually. Again, it's always so I I um I told Flora at the end of the day, hey, I made a thing called bee maths, and what it actually was, it's that my webcam like put me into a math sum so I could like hold up my fingers <laughs> and go like two or I could be like plus. And we'd, we've been trying it today with different different things. And um, she was very disappointed when I told her that because she thought I meant like literally like B maths, like with Bs. <laughs> so she, she was, so, when she saw my face on the video, she she was not happy. So then I, so then I had to make B maths. Yeah, and it's great. I can just make these things which are silly and fun. Um and people seem to enjoy it at the moment. So we'll just keep going. Yeah, no, they're they're awesome. How often do people get mad at you that they're just demos? Like I know a lot a lot of these things kind of get shared around. People right. are like, oh my God, it this changes everything. But you're just making demos to show off the the canvas. Right. Right. I mean this is this is yeah, this is the funny thing. Like these are demos to show what kind of thing is possible with the Teal Draw library, with the Teal Draw SDK. That is like their main goal most of the time. And yeah, it's a running joke that people think that we're announcing features, right? And and it's like, I'm trying to make the demos worse, right? <laughs> so that people don't think that they're supposed, you know what I mean? Oh, so. <laughs> But the thing is, it's it's actually a bit fun to lean into that a little bit, you know. I think um, part of it is that the following that's built for Teal Draw is 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 really nice. Like, there's a whole bunch of people who are like rooting us on, and and I think there's a bit of a you know like an in crowd. It's like it it's cool to know that they're just demos, you know. Like, actually, Teal Draw is something much bigger, right? You can you can build anything with it, and this is what typically happens. Like people reach out to us, and then and then like me or uh, my boss or people on the team, we we get like the the fun moment of being able to say, "Oh no, this is this isn't just a product." You know, like you could make this, and I think that's really exciting. You know, because people say, "I want to have this." You know, I want to have this feature, and I, and I get to say to them back, actually you could make this feature and you could make it really fast. Like I made this in four hours. I don't know what I'm doing, right? Like, you know, way better than me probably. Um, and yeah, let's talk and I can show you how to do it. Um, and like, hopefully, you know, we can share more, share more of these over time, like with like repo templates and blog posts and so on. But like, um, sometimes this stuff moves really fast, you know? <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it, it's fun. Um, tealdraw.com itself has the same has the same like story again and again. People think that that's our product, and it's like this glorified demo, you know. Um, and and we 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 do look after it. It's not like oh, it's just a demo, you know. We'll, um, and <laughs> so we do we are careful with it, but um, it is essentially a demo. Um, so we just get to make something that feels nice. We don't need to worry about getting people to log in like you can't register you know if that makes sense you just you just you just use it has there been any conversations about like taking any parts of these demos and maybe packaging them up into a product or is it really just like inspiration yeah i mean um for sure and like you know these these demos uh they have lots of different goals you know they there's there's really short term goals behind them around marketing and hype and interest and, th and there are longer term goals too. Um, partly we are trying to figure out some of these really tricky problems, um, like with using AI on the canvas, right? Like um, that's, that's basically our role. These really tricky canvas problems, <laughs> let us deal with them. So 
Um, that's that's one goal. Another goal is yes, like it, we would love to at some point be able to let people use these these like these more advanced features that we can't give you if you're not logged in. Basically, um, that that would be great. Like we we've we've, uh, we've played around with a couple of different ways of doing that, and we haven't landed on on like um, something that we wanted to ship yet. But I hope we can do that in the future. Um, one thing we are thinking of doing is putting up some of these demos as like time boxed things you can use. You know, like so um, because we don't know how much they will cost us, or we don't know like how much people will abuse them, <laughs> right? Um, and they are essentially experiments. Um, that's something we might try and do more. Is say like, hey, you can use this for one day, and I'm really sorry if you missed it. You know, and and I think that could be a fun way of letting more people play with them um, as well. So there, there's hopefully more things coming soon. Um, that's what I can say. So, so you've been using AI a lot in these demos. Do you do it like locally within the browser or is it a lot of like different APIs or just like one API that does a lot of really cool things? Like we're trying everything. We're trying absolutely everything. Um, I've like been using all of the different foundational models that are available on endpoints for their different strengths, you know, like with with make real um, GPT seem to be the best with that. Like GPT is just like great at writing JavaScript. Um, um, for autocomplete, we were basically relying on Haiku. That was only possible because Claude Haiku was so fast. Um, it did work with some others, and 4.0 came out during the time we were building that, and that was also pretty good. But Haiku was the fastest. Some of this math stuff, uh, we we're only able to do it because of Gemini. Google Gemini is really good at bounding boxes. And luckily, we just built some of those primitives like the week before. Um, so like, we, we have also tried uh, local stuff. We've been just doing some of this hand tracking, which is like, I guess, more like classic AI, right? Not, not the, like the large models that we're, we're now using. Um, we've also tried a whole bunch of Llama stuff. So like this is part of our job is to figure out um, figure out how to get the most out of the what's available. And to be honest, I think um, like the best way to build products with these things at the moment is to combine them all, right? Like like the the things I I build increasingly like use Gemini for this, use Claude for that, use GPT for that, and use something local for this. And I think that's realistically what's going to happen. I don't think people will just use one, you know, um, but we want to be able to like tell people what we found from that in, in on the canvas. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's still amazing to watch. It's such a huge inspiration. <laughs> so love the work you're doing. Um, one more question on the topic before we move on. Uh, so it's been a while. We had Steve uh, on a while ago now. Um, uh, so have you seen any unique uses of TL Draw uh, that customers or open source people are doing that's just like, oh, wow, I just hadn't imagined it being used like that? Right. Yeah, sure. Um, like, it's, 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 it's really hard to, like, think through because my head's, like, darting to all these different things, right? So on the one hand, I'm like, okay, some people just want a whiteboard, right? Some people just want to chuck a whiteboard and go, and it's kind of amazing to see, like, Oh right, yeah, that that just works. That's nice. Um, then there's some people using it as an annotation layer, um, and one of the things that I found quite surprising is that pe some people have been using it as an annotation layer on top of another canvas engine editor, right? So like I've seen I've seen um, some tools that are like architecture tools, right? And it's and 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 it's super domain specific for architecture. But it means it sucks at more like low fidelity, um, low fidelity canvas work. You know, like you want to draw arrows, you want to do like flow charts. That's been interesting. Like combining teal draw with another another editor and like locking the cameras together so they move as one, which is pretty cool. Uh, like in the open source world, world, uh, we've we've seen this like flow chart programming tool recently that's amazing, where basically you can write JavaScript into shapes and then just run it. And people have made all sorts of crazy things. I saw them make like Pong in it, 
where they're using like programmed teal draw shapes that move up and down. And like, that's crazy. And especially crazy because they actually built that before we release, released this binding API that, that makes it like 10 times easier. So I like feel really bad for them. Um, that, that this guy called Orion Reed, who we've now, uh, he's now working with us two days a week, um, has, be, has been making like, he made like Mario Kart in teal draw. Right, like which is which is kind of not, like like top down, right? Which is kind of like a nice affirmation that yeah, this is quick enough. You can basically use this as a game engine, and and using all sorts of like constraint models to make things move around as if it's like a physics engine, which is really cool. Um, it's just it's kind of it's kind of mind blowing. It's really hard to figure out like how do we support things so generally, you know? So like when I'm working on autocomplete. It's, it would be so much easier if we could just say, yeah, people are only using teal draw for like making state charts, right? Or people are only using teal draw to do little annotations or people are only using teal draw for one thing. So it's, it's a very tricky, but very like exciting challenge to work on that people are using this for all sorts of things. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's definitely really cool though. And, you know, I respect the, sort of challenge of, you know, building a generalizable platform that also, you st it still has to be a good whiteboard, right? <laughs> like that, that core, like, usage still has to be good. Yeah, I mean, like, I use it so much. I like, I'm constantly dog fooding with it. And obviously, like, as a user, but also like a, as a library user. So it's, it's nice to be able to like, push it and see where like, where the issues are, um, and then actually do something about it, and then go and go and fix it. I, I use it with my D&D &D group every week. And th because they're my friends, they don't mince their words. They tell me if something feels wrong. They're like, Lou, this is stupid. Why is that icon there? <laughs> like, what? And <laughs> so, like, sometimes, like, that's the harshest feedback. But it's nice to be able to just, like, see people str struggle with it and tell me exactly, exactly how it is. Um, and, like, the, the team... Here is so, like, cares so much about it, like sometimes too much, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> um, so, like, it's nice to work in a place where that sort of attention to detail is so important. Yeah, I, I resonate with that. Uh, working at Descript, I've loved just being able to focus on the UI and like make sure that it looks like pixel perfect. I, I gain an immeasurable amount of joy out of making some things look like invisibly pretty. <laughs> right, right. That's a really good way of putting it, actually. Invisibly pretty. I, I, I'm going to steal that, I think, because th this is what I say, right? Like, um, the, the thing is, if you, if you notice TL Draw, it's like we've done something wrong, you know, which is, which is kind of like a curse because <laughs> You want people to notice it, <laughs> but so like this is why some of these flashier demos are helpful because it's like a way of getting eyeballs on it and get people to really look at it. Um, but yeah, like with Make Real, um, when when we saw like l loads of people using Teal Draw, um, it's nice that they that they don't need to worry too much about like moving shapes around or drawing things. They can just think about wireframing and they can just think about making a website. That is the goal. It's so that like drawing something or like interacting with something in Teal Draw just feels natural. You don't need to know how to do it. Although like if you if you want to use it in a more advanced way, that's possible too. But like to use it fully, you shouldn't need to think about it or notice it. Yeah, that's that's a challenge. Um, so let's switch over and talk about uh, some of the research that you do with Ink and Switch. Um, so what does it mean to be uh, a researcher in residence? Uh, and then what sort of like research do you end up doing? Yeah, sure. So um, what it means for me um, as a researcher in residence at Ink and Switch basically means that I get to join their calls, right? So it's a fully remote team um, with like smaller groups within it. And every single Friday, I get the chance of and Monday as well, but I can only make Friday because I'm so busy, right? Like uh, every single week I can hop on and show what I've been working on and get some of the harshest feedback in the world, right? From like the smartest people in that field. 
um, <laughs> uh, and and also to see what other people have been working on and give feedback and to like be in that that network um, with uh, with all of these internal communications. Um, so and part of that can include like me uh, putting on uh, collaborations or meetings with our team here or just more generally. So like for example, like this week, uh, me and a couple of people from the Teal Draw team uh, were like sharing demos and work in progress things with some people on the Ink team there. So it's like this mutually beneficial situation. Um, <laughs> so it sort of pops up because um, I did a talk at a conference called Live last year and a, and a bunch of the Ink and Switch people were there and we got talking and that's how it came about. Um, so the work I'm doing is is like a continuation of, of that work, which is not teal draw work. It's, I guess, like toad pond work, right? Um, and so for me, that, that has recently been um, working on this music making tool I talked about, which is like a live programming tool. Um, and, and I've been doing this weird project called Seat, uh, which has been quite unusual because it's about how do we debug programs better, which sounds boring, right? And, and the weird thing is that I made like an initial demo for that um, that lets you debug your program uh, um, like, and, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very simple way. And I thought it was going to go down really badly. I thought people were going to hate it. But for some reason, it resonated. And, or like it hit a nerve at least. So so that currently I'm figuring out why basically, right? Like what, what's, what's currently available in the debugging programs world? What do people like? What do people hate? What do people have trouble with? And um, I'm trying to take forward what I've learned from like my more visual programming and seeing if it applies to more traditional programming. That's basically my research at the moment. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's an important area. Uh, I feel like one of the hardest parts of programming is when things don't go right. <laughs> right. Yes. And and like typically what that means is like switching modes, right? Like um you do all of your coding in one place and you tend to do all of your debugging in another place. And there are some like there are some better tools out there that let you do that more in one place. Um, but they don't seem to be the norm. Like they haven't been picked up as the norm in the industry, at least from what I can see. And so I think that's an interesting question. Like, why isn't that, why isn't that the norm? Is it because actually it's a really hard problem or is it like more of a cultural thing? Like are people attached to their step debuggers or whatever it is they use or their logging, you use console logging or whatever. Like, and it's been interesting to ask people about it because like, um, some people, I think, it's a sore spot. Some people hate step debuggers. Some people love step debuggers, but they and they think that everyone else is doing it wrong, and that's why they hate it. So it does seem like this. This maybe something culturally involved. Maybe so. so yeah, I don't know yet. That's basically where my research is going to try and figure that out. I'm excited to see what you come up with. Thanks. Cool. So on each episode, we like to ask a future-facing question. Um, and for you, I want to ask, what do you think the future of software interaction looks like? With the dawn of AI tools, things are changing. And I think UI is going to have to change to accommodate how people are thinking about computers differently. Right. I mean, OK, that's a big question, though, because there's like, what do I think will happen and what do I want to happen? Right. Because I think I'm worried, you know, with like, AI becoming more and more used. I'm worried about what we were talking about earlier, right? Where an AI does stuff for you and you're not involved, even if you want to be involved. Sure, if you don't want to be involved, fine, great. But what if I want to be involved, right? What if I want to tweak an output of an AI? You know, what if I want to influence it more, right? So like, I'm very worried about, um, about people who use computers having less control and more control going away to big companies and models. And we sort of lose our understanding of that. 
what I want is for people to be able to like collaborate with their computers if they want to, right? So that they they can influence it and steer it in a way. Like that's what I'm trying to explore um, here. Uh, I want <laughs> I want I want it to be a feedback loop if that makes sense. Um, I don't know which one's gonna happen. I, do you know what? <laughs> I'm trying to, so I'm trying to show people how things can be better a lot of the time. You know, I'm not necessarily gonna I, I'm gonna be the one that's gonna see it through, but I'm trying to like show, give people a taste of like, hey, what what does a slightly better AI collaboration look like? What does a slightly better creative tool look like? What does slightly better debugging look like? Um, and I think it's quite important because we use computers so much, or at least I do. Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think AI tools should be a collaboration. They should be a tool. And like, there's really like two extremes in the space right now. It's either you just, you one shot it and it's all done for you, or you really have no option. Like we need the the middle ground where it's like, this is a thing we can actually use. But I feel like given how Gen Z is with phones and not knowing how to send emails, the <laughs> the events that are about to come are are easy to predict. People are going to know how to use computers less. I find it odd that like our generation is might be like the most technically literate one just because we <laughs> were there before smartphones and they're at the end of like the computer age. So like just by happenstance, we are like the people best equipped to use a computer right now. Yeah, I mean it's it's hard to tell. I'm, but like I do have hope from from people innovating on these uh, on these tools. And I think like even even seeing like how uh, Replit right has like made some of made coding more accessible in many ways. Right, like even when I started code when I started coding, it was even a lot harder. You know, so um, you know I I <laughs> I'm reassured by like people kind of getting this. Getting the fact that that actually we don't just want to settle for coding being hard, being being like something that's really hard to get into. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work we could do still, obviously. Yeah, I'm just hoping for a more human computing relationship. I guess you know, um, and especially my my one hope for the AI future is that like hum that computers become a little bit more accessible to people who don't have the privilege to be computer savvy you know it's like if you're older or you come from a socioeconomic background that like just didn't grant you access it's like hopefully you can just use these things for something useful in your life without it being a, a drag yeah i mean like yeah i i hope i hope you know i i hope it doesn't mean that like there's going to be even less care put on, on things because I could I could see it going both ways really I could see some people really like you know taking the new technology technologies we've got and really making the most of them you know like using it as an opportunity to put more care into things you care about and just less care into the things that just need to be done you know but I can also see some people using it as as an excuse you know to say like Oh well, it does it for me, you know. Like, I think I think it can go both ways, and it really looks like, hey, AI is going to be here to stay. Um, so I'm, tr so I, I kind of like ex accepted that. <laughs> um, what I want to do is try and figure out how we make the most of it, you know. Cool. And with that, mm -hmm. let's move on to tool tips. So my first tool tip is not the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pay, pay your taxes kids okay so my my first actual tool tip is a framework called waku it also uses hono in the background but it is a uh it's react server components that's not next.js and you can actually use in your app the best way to think about it is it's imagine next.js app router minus everything that connects it to to next.js so you have React server components, you have a very lightweight router, that's it. Uh, if you want an introduction on how to use server components, uh, go to these docs, read it top to bottom, and you'll understand it. Avoid the next docs like the plague if you want a simple understanding of how this technology works and how you should use it. So 
If you've been looking for a tool to try out React server components and you haven't wanted to wade through all those docs, I highly uh, recommend Waku. Yeah, I saw Sunil Pai use this. That's how I first discovered it. Um, he basically like tweeted something like, hey, is there any like minimal React framework out there I can use? And he basically described <laughs> Waku one for one. And then someone, yeah, so obviously someone recommended it. <laughs> yeah, it comes from a pretty prolific creator too. He's done like five different state libraries for React. Yeah, it's good numbers. Next up we have building SimCity. Yeah, um, SimCity was a, a very important game in my childhood and, and probably one of the things that like helped motivate me into a more technical direction. Uh, I've really always loved the work that Will Wright and the folks around uh, that team, uh, just like Spore and all the other games that they had built, they're just like fantastic. The Sims, of course. Um, so uh, this this book is sort of uh, an encapsulation of the story around like how SimCity was built and its history, and just talking about the history of simulation and com and computing. And uh, it seems like. It's going to be a really, really fascinating read. I haven't bought it yet, but that's on my to-do list. Um, so yeah, definitely if if you've been inspired by SimCity or you're like interested in some like gaming history and early computing or you know whatever it may be, this seems like a really cool one to check out. And 90s gaming is such a crazy time for computer mm -hmm. science. Like if if I ever want to be humbled, all I have to do think is all I have to do is think about Roller Coaster Tycoon. It's like they built that whole thing in assembly. I can't, I literally can't even imagine how that would work. Right, right. I played so much of that game. Yeah, it was really fun. Next up, we have Salad Room. Right, Salad Room. So Salad Room is a way to share files between different computers or devices. Um, and it's made by a friend of mine here, part of the London coding scene, Anthony Cossens. And... This is why it's important, because on our team, we often share around GIFs, right? Like GIFs to be posted somewhere. And if you just share it on like Discord or like Twitter or something, like DMs, then it compresses the hell out of them. And then they end up looking pants when you post them up. So Salad Room is great because you can, you can do it and it doesn't compress it. And it's super easy. You just type in a code. We even ask them for like our own custom room for Teal Drawer. And we have a, like our own custom nice. room that keeps things up there a bit longer, which is nice. Highly recommend it. It's cool. I like that. And uh, the illustration. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. It, Allied Room is a bit of a, yeah, like a funny brand going on. I don't know. It's I, I feel like it's very British humor, you know? So uh, my last tool tip for the week is Turbo Repo V2. They added a really cool terminal UI mode where like before, if you're running a bunch of scripts with Turbo, it just kind of blasts the output all into one log. Really hard to understand or even like see the issues that are going on. Uh, with V2, they released this really cool terminal UI where you can like literally see each script in isolation, switch between them, uh, it's just so much better. And this replaces so many tools for me and like my mono repo tool set. Like usually you want to run like a server and something else at the same time and you use like concurrently or do it with like bash processes or something. This is such a better DX. You can like see each one, see the errors in its thing. Uh, I've been really enjoying it. So if you haven't checked out Turbo Repo, go check them out. And if you're on V1, upgrade to V2. It's so much better. So I have a literal tool tip today. So there's this website called toolstash.com, which is really fun. It is a way to inventory your physical tools. So you just take a picture of it. Um, it's got a nice uh, usage of AI, which literally just like gives you an auto classification for what the tool is. Um, but the whole point of this uh, site is to like keep inventory of your tools and you can like loan them out to people so you can keep track of like who borrowed what tool or whatever i love it just very simple very straightforward solves a good problem it is really a tool tool tip that one i like <laughs> finally an app to tell me that i did buy it and i did lose it and i have to go buy another <laughs> <laughs> yes okay next up we have just github Right, right. Hear me out. Hear me out, right? GitHub, you may have heard of it, right? <laughs> but 
like Salad Room, when you put GIFs and MP4s or whatever in issues, pull requests, it does not compress them. So what we do a lot at Teal Draw is say like when there's a when someone when you put in a pull request that has like a clear change that you can show visually, it makes sense to attach a GIF, right? To communicate with the rest of the team what the change was. And it just so happens that that GIF doesn't get compressed. So like if we're looking, if someone else is looking at that pull request and thinks, oh, that, that's worth sharing on Twitter or whatever, right? Then you can just copy paste it up with no compression. So add GIFs to your pull requests and your issues and everything. Like it's, it's a nice like visual record that can also double up as marketing content. Great tip. And then last up, we have Cap. I love this program. This is how I record all my GIFs. It's Cap. And I'm, I'm just surprised that more people haven't heard of it. Um, I have like a little cheat sheet of like how to get the most out of it, um, which is like way too boring to go through here. But like if anyone is out there and wants to use Cap and wants to know how to make like the highest quality GIFs that look smooth and are small, etc., then um, reach out to me. I'm, I can tell you. Uh, I'll do it for free. Um, so yeah, Cap is like the best GIF and video re screen recorder out there. Full stop. Minus that's awesome. I'm checking it out. And that wraps it up for Tool Tips this week. Uh, thanks for coming on, Lou. This was a really fun conversation about all the things that you're involved with and how AI and code might blend together in the future. Thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you. Yeah, Lou, it's been an absolute pleasure. Love all the demos that you've been working on and all the stuff that you're posting. Uh, and, and again, your writing is amazing. So thanks for doing it and keep it up. Thank you. I will do. Keep following.